Well, it's a very great privilege today to welcome Dr. Warren Farrell, who's an old friend of mine. Hello, Warren. Hello. It's been, um, I, I, I'm afraid to say it is pretty old. We've been in the mid 80s, I guess it was, in your apartment. Yeah, New York. I was in New York for five years and I first heard about the work you were doing um, in relation to men, which really intrigued me. And you, I don't even remember, you told me you actually came and, and saw me in my apartment. <laughs> yes, I just, yes. I have a terrible memory. Anyway, but that was the beginning. We started, we got into contact. You just published. Now, let's go back a little bit. So you started off your career uh, very much as an advocate for women. You wrote a, a famous book called The Liberated Man, um, which was very much about trying to persuade men that they were going to benefit from the women's movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then you were elected three times to the National Organization for Women. So you were right up there as a, a white knight, may I say it, uh, someone promoting feminism. Uh, and then rather like me, you, you started to think about men and started to write about men. And when I met you, uh, you just published one of your most important books, I think, which was when, when, Why Men Are the Way They Are. Do you want to tell me a little bit about all of that? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. I was on the board of now in New York City and was very much um, the, I guess, the, probably the best known spokesperson for women's issues who was a man. And um, I was speaking all around the world on, on this topic at that time and, and, uh, and completely support the part of feminism that is ex expanding options for women, doing things like getting women involved in team sports and single you know, person sports. And there's so many dimensions of the women's movement that, that has really enhanced and enriched our lives. Um, but there was also something else that was happening. Uh, when I was on the board in New York City, um, we were we, they were we were getting a lot of requests from women. No, not, I, that's not true. We were getting demands from women who were being divorced saying, um, I demand that you not have a position of equality of equal fathers and mothers opportunities to be with children after divorce. I know what's best for the children, and um, and I want to be able to move, to start a new life where I don't get involved with. I've learned about how to have a better man. I want to start a new life with a new man that I just met. Move to wherever we need to move to. I'll decide what's best for my children and I'll take them take them in. So now faced a political dilemma, and the political dilemma was, do I go ahead and say to women? we are in favor of equality that means equal time of the child with both mother and father and lose your background and support which would then undermine our political base to do a lot of other good things for women or do we um do we take that um our belief in equality and apply it to children's rights to both mother and father equally and so there was a debate and and we there was a legitimate both sides to this argument and but everyone ended up disagreeing with me and um, with with a, a woman named Karen DeCrow, who was not on the New York City board, but she had been a national president of now. And the two of us became sort of alienated, especially myself, who said I thought it was really um, important for children to have access to both parents. But I didn't know for sure. I we only had a. We only had data that is now maybe 1970-ish um, that this happens, so almost 45-year-old data. Um, and 45 years ago, we didn't have the longitudinal experience of what happens to children when they don't have an equal amount of father and mother. So I began to research that. That led to a book called Father and Child Reunion, um, but it basically led from my being um, doing very well financially to maybe losing multiple multiple millions of dollars because I, I chose to sort of say, um, you know, men are not, um, I, the two flaws of feminism were demonizing men and undervaluing the family, I came to understand. And so as I became articulate about that, um, I lost the a lot of my feminist support. Yeah, it's not a good career move to start supporting men publicly. <laughs> no, oh, it's funny, Susan Faludi came to my house and interviewed me for Backlash. And um, she said that the reason you got involved with uh, men's issues is because you make a lot more money uh, that way. And I said, Susan, write a book supporting men's, men's issues, even, um, even a minimal amount, and see if it outsells Backlash. Well, Backlash was for about 26 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, and her book that did um, come out of interviews that was reasonably empathetic to men 
you just it got great publicity at the beginning but it just did not sell yeah that's right i mean i i had the same thing of course my original background was sex therapy and you know i had 10 years of promoting sex and i did very well and when i started to really start to promote men um you know, it, it didn't do me any good at all in terms of yeah. speaking engagements, in terms of public support, in terms of access to mainstream media. And I remember someone saying to me, oh, you've, you've given up sex to support men because it's a, you, you'll make a lot more, it's exactly the same thing, you'll make more money. Away. You have to be kidding. What's happened to you is also a sign of how feminism is tilted um, mm -hmm. from being originally about equality, about promoting opportunities for women to really working extremely hard to play down any discussion of men's issues as, as of course we saw with Kathy J in the red pill yes. um, and uh, you know they have a ferocious grip on our society now yes. Yes. Um, so anyway moving on um, Warren you you then went on to write a whole series of books about men which have been terribly important and most particularly your new book which is called the, the boy crisis uh, which has been published this month. Uh, maybe you could show us that, the cover yes. of the book. Oh, sure, yes. Yeah, because I want to mainly focus on that today. Looks a lot uh, better than your face, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> no. It's a, anyway, I'm terribly excited about that. I think, as always, you've done a wonderful job um, compiling a huge amount of information. You're very methodical in your research, and, and there's fantastic i really advise that people have a look at this book because it brings together extraordinary information that i didn't know um and i just want to mention some of the things that i found really interesting in particular i was just gobsmacked by research asking parents to be whether they wanted their first born to be a boy or a girl and the, the dads almost, almost twice as likely to, to prefer a daughter to a son and I found that so tragic. Can you tell me why you think that is? Yes, and I guess one of the fathers that I spoke to really just put it all together. I first asked in the earlier part of our dinner party evening, um, you know, would you enjoy um, would you enjoy a son more than or a daughter more? And he said, I guess you know, playing with my son would be just wonderful and, and just we could rough and tumble. I wouldn't have to worry about um, my wife, Mary, um, suggesting that I was being too rough with him nearly as much as I would if I had a daughter. And his, his eyes lit up. And then a little bit later in the evening, I said, so uh, your, your wife is pregnant. So what do you prefer for you to have? And he said, even though I'd enjoy playing with my son more, I'd want it to be a girl. And he said, and I said, why? And he said, because a girl has more opportunities today. A girls are more re admired and respected today. It's a better world for girls today than it is for boys. So yeah. uh, he didn't say this, but he, in essence, he would. The bottom line was, I'll give up my fun and my um, uh, for something that's better for my child, which I thought was very touching. And that reflects yes. um, the 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 aggregate data um, as well. Research. Yeah, my son. It's just had a little daughter, my first yeah. grandchild. I mean, said the same. Where well, he said he wanted, he preferred a daughter. I mean, and I hear that a lot. Yeah. And to me, it really reflects an awareness in our community that boys are having a hard time. Which is, of course, what what your book is all about. That boys yeah. are in trouble. That it's very hard raising boys and raising confident boys in a society where boys get very little encouragement. Where boys are blamed for men and boys are blamed for all sorts of things in our society, unfairly. And I mean, I just think that's such, such a telling piece of research about where we are now. But just going on, the other one I found incredibly striking was, was the fact that uh, this is the first generation of boys we're seeing now who are gonna end up less educated than their parents. Can you tell me about that? Yes, all and all 60, and this is this, what I'm going to say next is really where I got myself energized to um, say something needs to be done about the boy crisis. And in these more than 60 of the largest developed nations, boys are falling behind girls in almost all academic areas, but especially in reading and writing, reading and writing are the two biggest predictors of success. And so I started asking myself, what's common to all developed nations? 
And what was common is that developed nations, because they had a bit more access to survival, uh, were able to allow permission for two things. One was for divorce, and the second is for children to be able to be born to mothers who were not married. And so I looked carefully at those two groups. And in both groups, there were a, a huge percentage of boys who were doing terribly. But there was a decent percentage of boys doing pretty well. And so I started breaking those two groups down more um, fi uh, finitely. And I found that in the, the boys that were doing poorly had in common that they had no father involvement or very minimal father involvement. The boys that were doing well had significant father involvement. It is just that the boys are falling so far behind, not only girls, but where they, they were. But the, the, the tragedy in that statement, though, is even greater for this reason. Um, the, the, the boys who, um, boys who, like if our grandfathers didn't do well academically, um, they could immediately use their physical body um, and they could use their muscle. Um, but we have been a, a world that has morphed from muscle dependency to, to uh, the mental, from muscle to mental or from muscle to microchip. And so in the world of mental and microchip, there is, if you don't graduate from high school, uh, you have a t more than 20% chance of being unemployed. And an unemployed man is not desirable. You know, women don't say, oh, he's reading the boy crisis. He must, uh, and he's in an unemployment line. I'm really interested in him because he's educating yeah. himself on <laughs> that type of thing. Yeah. And so um, yeah, yeah. He, is, he, he then becomes left out of female selection and then a woman gets frustrated and she has a child without a father and then the whole process um, continues. Uh, absolutely. And then uh, the other thing I noticed was the, the, the suicide figures. Um, and you've got incredible data showing these leaps upward from about age 10 in yes. the suicide rate of young men, young boys. You're absolutely right. The, at yeah. the age of nine, both, fa both boys and girls have almost zero suicide and it's even. Um, between the ages of 10 and 14, though, as boys begin to develop their hormones and testosterone and get a little bit adjusted to the male role, expectations and pressures, uh, the boys' suicide rate doubles that of girls. The age of 15 and 19, when all that sets in even more, it's quadruple that of girls. By the ages of 20 to 24, it is almost six times that of girls. And so you get a sense, but you no, know, we don't, you know, obviously if this was happening to, to, to girls, um, that their suicide rate was going to from equal to boys to by the age of the mid twenties, six times that of boys. We would all know that all over yeah. the world, and that would be absolute evidence as to how the world discriminates against girls. But the reverse, not we don't see now, it. Because I've been fighting. We've got a national suicide prevention body, and I've been talking to them for years and years and years about this, trying to get, to get them to address the fact that it's particularly a male problem. The seven people who kill themselves in a, every day in Australia, five of them are male, and they emphatically refused because they kept on saying women attempt suicide as much, or if not more, than men. Uh, I would have thought the fact that men succeed is a bit of a difference. We have, I mean, we don't have as good figures on the on the boys that I could find, but we we do have that a doubling of suicide rates between teens and twenties for boys. Yes. So it is a, a dire problem. Because um, you're, no, yeah, sorry, go on, Mark. Because go you're on. so um, helpful to the Australian society about the suicide, uh, let me help clarify to the listener here what the difference is between committing suicide and attempting suicide. Attempting suicide is part of the solution. Attempting suicide is a way of saying, I do have people out there who care. I need to pe I need to have the people who care about me move uh, move fr me from the back burner of their life to the front burner of my life. I uh, that's number one. Number two, it is a way of saying I do believe that people are capable of helping me, and if I speak up, they will want to help me. So, mm -hmm. the, so a woman signals it's a sort the, of cry for help. The traditional. It's, a, it's yes. definitely a cry for help, and the um, but, uh, but the internal belief is. If I cry for help, someone wants me to be alive and will listen. The internal belief, belief for the boy who commits suicide is that there's no one who loves me, no one who needs me. Yeah. There's no hope of that changing. 
if I do express my weakness and failure and fear of, 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 of life to anyone who does respect me, he or she will only decrease respect for me. If I tell this to my girlfriend, she'll run. If I tell this to a guy at school, he'll go, mm. um, And so it's a, it's, it's a feeling of hopelessness. And it's one of the reasons I created this 60 plus um, inventory of, of depression and suicide, because I found that we were measuring depression in males um, in the same way that we were measuring it in females. And in fact, there's about 45 different signals of depression and suicide in, in males and that are different from those that are in, in, um, um, described among females. And so it's really important uh, for us to understand both sexes' way of, um, of grieving and expressing um, uh, a need for help. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've been doing re really well in promoting the book. I mean, this is sounds a bit cynical, but I've been intrigued at you, at you getting involved in the arguments around the school massacres, the school shootings, mm -hmm. and using that to talk about, um, you know, the father deprivation issue, mm -hmm. uh, making the point that an awful lot of the people, um, you know, the, the perpetrators of the massacres are, are fatherless young men. Um, yeah. I guess... I don't know. I've been I've been sort of thinking about that and thinking it makes me squirm a little bit because I worry it's drawing too long a bow. I mean, millions of um, father deprived young men aren't committing school massacres. So there are a whole range of other issues involved here. Um, oh, I don't know. What, did anyone challenge you on that? No, you're the first, but that's fine. <laughs> um, but it's not. A, um, here is the challenge: uh, when boys hurt when they take guns, for example, and commit suicide, uh, no one pays attention. Um, but when boys, but boys who hurt, hurt us. They hurt us in a lot of different ways. I mentioned in passing a few minutes ago, um, ISIS recruits are almost all fatherless boys. Uh, obviously, 99.9% .9 of boys growing up without dads um, do not um, do school uh, or you know mass shootings. They do not join ISIS. So that's the extreme of what fatherlessness is often highly connected to. Um, but on the much, but on the less extreme level, uh, where the boy, even where it's extreme for the boy, he commits suicide and kills himself. There's local funerals, and then no one goes ahead and says. Gee, maybe if we had fewer guns, he wouldn't have he wouldn't have likely to, uh, been likely to do that. Or maybe if we um, spent more time trying to understand him, or if he had a father who was connected to him, or even a role model that was connected to him, uh, or even if the schools were um, had a, a higher percentage of male teachers, so that boys don't have to go from female only homes to female only schools. And then we say, I wonder why they suddenly w found a gang leader was a good role model. Um, and so these questions are not being asked when it's anything less than a mass shooting. Deeply, yeah. deeply cynical and troubling and sad, but it really proves the points that both of you and I have spent our, our recent lives um, uh, of making. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, look, I, th I, I, as I said, I was very ambivalent about it because yes. I, I obviously have worked about a lot of my life trying to speak out about what's happening to boys and, and the importance of fathers in boys' lives. So I think it's fantastic to highlight that. And the fact that in America, particularly, there's some serious conversations happening around that issue is wonderful. I just a bit worry about the sort of causal links. There are so many complexities here. Um, yeah. And, and I, you know, I was delighted to see you highlighting some of these issues in your new book. Um, but one of the problems I could see you tiptoeing, because one of the problems in talking about fatherlessness is also how do you do that without attracting anger from single mums? And yeah. you're very careful about that. And so uh, there is a fair amount in the book about, you know, what can a single mom do? And in the, uh, for one thing, what she can do is to question whether or not she doesn't have a father involved because the father does things that she considers irresponsible, like roughhousing, putting the child in jeopardy by roughhousing, 
uh, by doing things that are very adventure and exploratory in orientation or is insensitive because she for he forces the child to finish his or her peas before they have their ice cream and, and he should be more sensitive than that. There's a great many things that fathers do that are extremely different from what mothers do. What we find is that children who do the best have a, have a tension between the mothers and fathers that I call like a checks and balances. And that we, but that, that fathers have not studied what the, they don't, I, I don't know a father who knows that when he roughhouses, he's increasing the, he's increasing the likelihood of a boy or a girl being able to distinguish between being assertive and aggressive. I don't know a father who's able to explain to a mom that when he roughhouses, he's creating a bond with that child that he's able to leverage to have that child go to bed in an earlier time for fear that they would lo will lose the opportunity to roughhouse. Um, and that and that bond allows that father to to um, set and not just set boundaries and then repeat them and they're, they're not obeyed like moms are more likely to do. Um, but they're but to enforce boundaries, which then forces the child to focus not on immediate gratification, but on postponed gratification. And yeah. postponed, postponed gratification is the single most important ingredient coming from enforced boundaries that leads to children being able to to better in school to if they if they want to join a basketball team to having the discipline to know the all the different plays in the basketball team and, and so on and so that th that leads to boys being proud of themselves as opposed to ashamed of themselves which leads yeah. to boys being more likely to participate rather than withdraw uh, when but boys with where we where we started this whole point was uh, was about you know that there are lots of women who don't want to buy into that tension that's inevitably there between the parenting styles of men and women and who thinks it's easier to do it on their own. And where I think you are far too kind to single mothers is, I mean, you you praise the job they do as, you know, many of them do a heroic job raising children on their own, and I agree with that, but you don't call them out on the fact that there are so many single mothers out there who are embracing the opportunities provided to them by the the family law system to just push men out of their children's lives. Yeah. And that is absolutely reprehensible. And we need to talk more about that. Karen Strawn, of course, is a classic example of someone who talks a lot about that mm -hmm. and women being irresponsible in that respect. I don't mean to quarrel with you on everything, Warren, because I think there's so many issues you highlight in the boy crisis, which are extremely important. Uh, I was pleased you were talking a lot about the whole issue of uh, children in de facto relationships. And I mean, that's a fascinating area. Someone once said to me that that has been one of the uh, most important areas of, of social science research in recent years. Uh, uh, the emergence of research showing that kids in de facto relationships aren't doing as well as we thought they would. I mean, there was an assumption by many people that, you know, the children would be the glue. We, you know, we're two people who love each other and we're having kids together and and that will mean that our, the, the, having the children together will mean that those relationships are as stable as a marriage. You know, the marriage is just a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating in Australia when our first research started to come through showing that is absolutely not the case, mm -hmm. um, that, that these marriages are just as unstable, these de facto relationships are just as unstable with or without children. I mean, that people were really surprised by that. Yeah, and uh, you're, you've got very good data in your book on about that. Yes, and, and this is, so there's when in the United States, 53% of women under 30 who have children have children without being married. And so, uh, but this group of people without being married, this has many dimensions to it. Some of them, um, you know, have children by, you know, anonymous sperm, others by identified sperm, others by people who are a boyfriend, others by a boyfriend who is a loser they, from their perspective, and others, a small, relatively um, medium sized to small group, are living with somebody and they're, they fall into the category that you were just talking about. Well, we're, we're, we're living in the same house. We have a relationship. It's all going to be fine. It's a, the marriage is just a contract and piece of paper, but you're absolutely right. The, the, the data shows that after two years, it's 40% of the fathers, the children do not have 
any contact with their fathers or, or else very minimal contact with their fathers for the next three or four years after yeah. that. And yeah. so obviously there is uh, uh, the father involvement dimension of, of, of children um, who grow up without being married is very significant. So we just have to fit, no matter what our moral beliefs are, um, you know, we're all in favor of female freedom, but female freedom stops when a woman makes a free choice to have a child. And once that cho free choice to have a child occurs, then her entire focus changes, ideally changes, to what is best for my child. And among the things that's best for, the, for a child is to have stability for the child and a father involved in that stable relationship. I am not a moralist. I am not somebody who says you're a sin if you have sex outside of marriage or, you, or you're not married. If you don't have children, do whatever you'd like to do. Um, but if you have children, we now know that that marriage does create a type of stability that children yearn for, need, and flourish, um, especially when the father is not just a, um, a money maker. Another piece of research I discovered in, in doing the boy crisis was that, 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 that if you have to choose, once a family has an income more than $50,000, um, almost all of the time, if you, if you have to choose between a father's time and a father's dime, if you will, um, the father's time is a lot more important to the child, both boy and girl, than a father's dime, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I was very interested in the way you set that up, um, Warren, because you, 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 you talk about, for instance, uh, you know, what would make a, a man happier to be a third grade teacher or to be an engineer. You're talking to men, which is a wonderful idea about what would what will really fulfill them, what will really give them purpose in life. But you do t tend to have it in for doctors, lawyers and engineers. <laughs> um, uh, um, and I don't know. I mean, I, I know, I get that. And I get what you're saying about the long hours that men, oh, in many of these demanding careers, meaning it's very hard to be a good father. Um, but I see, I would, I have, I, yeah, go ahead. Go on, you, go, you go on. I, I would break that down a little bit there. Um, I, I think being a lawyer oftentimes does help you become successful um, by uh, doing, um, by listening to a person for a few minutes um, to pick up the gist of what they're saying and then while they're developing their argument to begin to formulate how you can either interrupt them or have a, choose their weak point to be, to be able to defeat them. And that is a, a type, if you're a really good lawyer who's working 60, 70 hours a week also, um, and you're doing that every day, and then you come home to your wife or your children, um, and, you're, uh, and you're applying that same thing that you've learned to do that's made you successful at work, your wife often doesn't feel heard and your children don't feel heard. And so the, often the things that make you successful at work as a lawyer often make you unsuccessful at home. So that's the, the lawyer aspect of it. The medical doctor aspect of it is that uh, oftentimes uh, a medical doctor works long hours and has to be responsive to every emergency outside. And that does sometimes undermine the ability of the children to get the attention that they need. The engineering part of it is that many men just do, they know that they can make a good living being an engineer, uh, but oftentimes they are an engineer and it's not their dream, it's what they can, and so that they're, because they're good at it and they know they can make good money at it, and a woman will be attracted to them because of those two things, um, they will be, they oftentimes don't even allow themselves to get in touch with what I call the glint in their eye. And I'm saying to men, you know, be an engineer if that's the glint in your eye. But if you, if, if you really would love to be that artist, that writer, that actor or whatever, or um, do something in a nonprofit, um, then nurture that for a while and see if you can be economically responsible um, with that. So I, that's sort of my, yeah. my take on those but, three. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just think being a doctor can be a glint in your eye for very good reasons. These are, these are jobs can, can, can where can people... Yeah, are doing a you know not sometimes they're out there to make lots of money that's true, uh, but sometimes I mean I know so many doctors who work so hard helping people doing wonderful things to keep people healthy, and I, look, I, I, I know the lawyers Warren who are slaving long hours to bail out men in family court. I have lawyers who are working to try to do something about the domestic violence laws, uh, you know and 
and I want to talk about my dad, my father, who was an academic, an extremely successful, uh, eminent academic, worked incredibly hard, but was also an amazing father. He worked a lot from home. Um, I mean, I think we have to be very careful not to suggest that as you know, as, as, as some of the people working in this area do, um, that, you know, these, these traditional male careers preclude the possibility of being good fathers. Um, and there's all, and you know, many women are working into, moving into demanding careers too. And, and um, you know, it's a question of balance. It's a question of trying to be, hopefully being in a relationship where one person can pick up the slack at some times. Uh, but I, I want to, put in a word for tradition, men in traditional jobs who are contributing to our society and also are good dads. We don't want to denigrate that. I would 100% agree with you, and I would even take that a step further, Bettina, which is a lot of what I, because in the old days, the society had men's sense of purpose really clear. You, um, you train yourself to be disposable either in war or uh, work as hard as you can at work and be an effective disposable in, in work like the Japanese call the executives. Um, they say they oftentimes die of karoshi, which is death from overwork or death at the desk. And so, um, and, and now today we don't need as many men usually fighting in most countries in wars. And uh, we also don't have the, the male as breadwinner being the sole definer of, of, of masculinity. Warren, anyway, great pleasure. I'm very excited about your new book, The Boy Crisis. I hope people will tr track it down. I'm sure it's available through Amazon in Australia. Uh, and there is a wealth of information in there that will interest people and that parents, fathers and mothers need to look very carefully at to learn more about what's happening to our boys. So I hope we'll have more conversations like this in the future, Warren. Absolutely. I, I love the vigorous interchange. I also love speaking to somebody who knows a great deal and has done her own research and also one of the few women in the world who have, really has the courage to speak up about these issues and especially doing it from a liberal perspective, which is usually seduced into feminism only and, and males uh, as being part of the negative patriarchy. So I, I doubly honor your courage, Bettina. You are really, you're really one of a kind in this world. Thank you, Warren. We'll talk soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Very good.